want to put the discussion we had prior to the break in the context of this slide. I, when I take a look at new data analysis problems, you notice I was writing on the board while the speakers were talking. I, I usually categorize any problem I could work with in one of these five categories. And for those of you that read the paper by John McGregor and his other students that I posted to the website, you'll notice that he did the same in that paper. They looked at the at data analysis problems as falling into one of these categories here. Uh, so let's take a look here quickly. Batch monitoring. Uh, monitoring the batch and then classifying at the end, making a zero one classification. Uh, I, when we get to the process monitoring section of the course, I will indicate how process monitoring is kind of like a classification of zero one, even though classification will typically cover under the section of prediction because you're making some form of prediction. But monitoring really is the form of zero one prediction. What's the best quality at the end? Uh, we're cover that right at the end of the course, we'll look at a topic called improving, optimizing, and controlling processes. And I'll just give a very brief intro to it today. But very often we want to know how we can achieve better operating conditions, optimize our process, or improve it in the latent variable space. Um, if there's a holdup or delay in the process and trying to find out what's the root cause of that, uh, this is a problem, obviously, an economic problem or, or some other form of trouble shooting group looking at the problem in a troubleshooting context. What is causing that troubleshooting? Which observations have most hold up? What are the characteristics of the high hold up condition? And then, obviously, once we've uncovered those characteristics, we can try to figure out how we can undo that in our process. Ideal conditions or tensile strength, again, this comes in the category of process improvement to reach a certain target to optimize. Reduce carbon emissions by making a form of prediction. You can look at it either in both of those contexts as a form of prediction or, or a reduction of carbon. Is, when you see these words like reduce or improve, they're really just saying in disguise, optimize really is what, what that is. Uh, or when someone says find me the best, Whenever you hear the word best, immediately you need to think optimize. Because when someone says best, it always can be written as an optimization problem. Predictive controller, um, we're looking at a predictive model that can predict the dynamics of the process. In spec or out of spec, you can either see that as a modeling, um, a predictive modeling or a monitoring problem. In spec or out of spec, am I in control or out of control? Um, plot prediction, clearly in the Section three, melt flow prediction, particularly real time. I'll show you an example of something very similar coming up next. So category three, blending to achieve a target despite varying inputs. Uh, was kind of how I paraphrase what you probably had said there. Uh, how can we make our process robust to varying inputs? Our processes always have. If you think of the process as a black box. You're accepting multiple inputs and you're producing, let's just look at one particular product. If your plant produces multiple products, just look at them each in turn. You're getting varying inputs to any process. You're producing some product and you want this product to have the same level of quality all the time, no matter how variable your inputs are. So each input here, if I look at a histogram, can have a huge distribution, very wide range of inputs that you accept. Ultimately, what you want at the end, if I plot my quality variable, it's called Y, I want a flat line. So every single product I'm producing every day has the same quality. That will never happen, okay? No matter how much money and effort we do, we will never achieve that as engineers. But we try to do as best we can. If I draw a histogram of my true output, it has some sort of variation. I want to pull or push that histogram really in so that ultimately I'm producing something like that, a very narrow distribution, very little variation in my output, no matter what I put into my process. Okay? So that's what this topic is here. And then optimizing for dollars clearly over here. So that's how I look at problems, and you'll see that coming through throughout the course. Let's jump back now to the core concept here. What is latent variable? Okay. Who's familiar with latent variables? 
There's a very brief introduction to the undergraduate courses. Uh, what I give in two, three hours, we're going to cover you over 12 weeks times three hours. Okay. So what you heard in undergrad is a tiny, just a, a taste. Okay. So let's go in, in more depth. One example I'd like to give to people who are unfamiliar with latent variables. Think of your health as a latent variable. You know, thinking today, how would you say you're healthy or not? And you would think back over the past month, and you could imagine that you could say, well, I'm feeling better and better and better, or I'm not, I'm, my health is kind of feeling slightly off. So you can build a, you have a local model in your head of how healthy you're feeling. You also have a, a model of, since you were, say, a teenager, when you can roughly remember your own state of your body, and so on. Over that period of time till now, would you say your health has improved? Maybe you've been working out regularly and you feel feeling better, or you've been eating better, or you quit smoking and you feel your health is improving, or you've just started smoking and you feel your health is decreasing, or, what, or maybe you've started smoking but you haven't felt the effects yet, etc. So you have in your mind a mental estimate of your level of health, but that's just your narrow viewpoint. Imagine a doctor who sees many patients a day. I walk in, I look fairly fit, but maybe I've got some huge catastrophic health condition. But the doctor looks at me, and over the many patients he sees, I might look like a reasonably fit person. But then the doctor starts asking me questions about my lifestyle, what I drink, do I smoke, do I eat this, do I eat that, they do blood tests. They measure my temperature. Um, they maybe do tests for my cholesterol, measure various dimensions, my waist to hip ratio, blood sugar, etc. And from those inputs, the doctor is able to construct a, a metric in his head or her head of how healthy I am and can say, you know, Kevin, to improve your health, you should change these things in your lifestyle. Or, we, um, or you're doing fine, keep going as you are. Okay? That health is a latent variable. It's hidden. That's what the word latent means in English, hidden. So it's not something the doctor can just plug some sort of device into me and measure my health on a scale from 0 to 100. Okay? There is no such device. But what the doctor can do is use these inputs, and there's many more okay, available, to come up with some estimate of how healthy I am. And and base that also not just on me, but on the patients that that doctor sees. So elderly people, younger people, middle-aged people, that doctor can say, on this relative overall population, this is where you fit. So if we drew a, a histogram of healthy people, I don't know if it's even normally distributed, maybe it's not, but these are people that are poor health, these are people that have good health, this is average health, the doctor could say, well, you're lying over there, or you're dead on average, or no, there's some significant improvements you need to do to get yourself over to the good side. So that's a latent variable, health. Okay. Another one like that is quality of life. People say Canadians have great quality of life. What do they mean? Any, what would you say characterizes quality of life? That's a, okay, that's another one. What is standard of living? Quality of life, standard of living. How would you, how would you quantify that? And what would you start to measure to, to quantify it, shall we? Uh, like how long people live, average. Average life expectancy, anything else? Yeah. Okay, more specific? The system that we got into Okay, what's available? Yeah. There are two different ways. There's what they're currently using on the international stage. Which is right now, it's how long you live, how much money you have, uh, access to food, security. And there's the other side of things as well. You would ultimately say it's up to happiness. And then how do you define whether or not a population is happy or not? Okay, so happiness I would see also as another latent variable. It's not something I can just plug in and measure your happiness and someone else's happiness and then as a result measure the average happiness in this room. I can't do that. There's no such tool or device available to me. But I can maybe ask questions. I have a questionnaire, which is what they typically do to assess happiness. And they use the inputs from that questionnaire. Yeah, and just um, speaking on those terms, I know that France recently set out, I think last year in November, they wanted to ship from GDP to a happiness ratio. And I have no idea how they were planning on measuring that. But I do know that there's a general push 
amongst everyone. And several countries have indicated that they don't want to use GDP as their metric that they want to be known by, but yeah. they have been seeing things. Okay. So all these things like that, quality of life um, and happiness, intelligence, uh, health, all these things, none of these we can measure directly, but we can get some sort of inputs and then measure uh, or come up with a way to quantify it overall as a latent variable. So that's what I see as a latent variable. And one of the tasks that you're going to have for homework uh, is to think about one of these types of latent variables and then talk about it in the class next, next time, okay? So have that in the back of your mind for the next week. You'll be surprised. When you start thinking about these things in that context, you'll be surprised how many things we take for granted. And someone says, oh, Canadians have great quality of life. They say it, we kind of know what they mean, but no one really knows what they mean. Okay, so take, take a look at that. Yeah? Um, I would see it more as something that's hidden that we can't we can't get directly, but other variables contribute towards it. Other things that we can measure contribute towards this variable that we can't measure. That's a that's a good mental picture to have for now. Okay. Another latent variable. Temperature in this room, okay? Four temperature probes in every corner of the class, let's say. And I leave them on over the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And I'm recording the temperature every few minutes and every point over there. Four variables, four tags, many, many rows in the data set. What's driving that movement up and down? So any input that affects the temperature in the room is a potential driving force. So in a room like this, mainly this glass, and if I had these open here, we'd see more oscillations in the data. The level of accuracy in the control system, if it's air conditioning or heating, would, would affect that. Four measurements, but how many latent variables in that data? Not a trick question. Just, uh, just how many? If you had to say how many, how many things are actually happening in that data set? How many would you say? Probably one. One thing happening is probably fair statement. All four temperatures are moving together, so there's really only one thing going on in that data set. But I happen to have four measurements of the same thing. Okay, does everyone see that? This room's temperature is moving up and down in every, in all these four corners of the room. But there's probably only one driving force, mainly let's say radiation from the sun or air conditioning. Yeah. So let's say you know it's the heater that's changing the temperature primarily, and we have you know probes over here and probes back there, okay? and there's some delay, let's say, from what the probes here see to the probes back there. See. Would we then call that two latent variables because? Like they're different in time, or yeah. does that still get considered one? And we'll see later on how to remove that time effect by shifting our data sets. Sure. Okay. But for now, let's say, let's say our data points here. Let's say I've only got a hundred data points measured over three days, so time delays is not a big deal. I'm measuring the temperature in the room once per hour, so that minor delay of the heat kicking on and for it to reach the back is relatively small and not going to show up many degrees. So really, in this data, even though I'm measuring four different things, there's only one driving force. Same thing for that distillation column I mentioned earlier. We would put a temperature sensor on every single tray, but the column's temperature moves up and down together as one unit. We're just going to see 30 measurements moving up and down. Okay? Same thing here. One latent variable that's the system that's driving, driving it. And um, the driving force let's say it's the heat from the sun, is correlated with the temperature reading from the thermometer. So we get a very strong correlation between what our driving force is and the measurement we're taking. Okay. And if I had to plot that data set, we'll see the following. If I plot the front left temperature versus the back left temperature, this is a scatter plot, and we're seeing very strong correlation between those two variables. Okay. If I plot three variables against each other, the front right, front left, and the back left, 
again, I'm seeing a strong 3D correlation. So just for those of you that are not uh, familiar with this concept of scatter plots, quick recap, I take my front left temperature and my front right temperature at that instant in time, plot that location. Another temperature at an instant in time, front left, uh, back left, plot that location. So every data point here represents one instant in time. The 3D cube, every single point, same thing, one instant in time. And what you can do is you can do pretty things like this. Okay? I can put those on a cube and I can make it rotate around for you so you can see it from all angles. Okay? That's that same data set. Um, how do I put this in a new okay. So I just called them x1, x2, x3 for convenience, but they're the same data that we saw there earlier. You can see there how they fall pretty much in a straight line. Okay, if I temporarily pause it over there, the majority of the data, I'll talk about the blue points in a minute, go across the diagonal of the cube. That's the latent direction in the system. That's the main direction along which all the data moves. That's our latent vector. Okay. Those points over there in blue are outliers. They're unusual data, and in fact, they come from. <coughs> let's just go back up to the, the raw data. They come from this period of time over here. You see, someone came into the room in the front and opened the door, and the cold air from the passage came in. So the front left and the and the front right temperature dropped. Ignoring the delays in the room program. So that, that could be one explanation. Maybe another explanation is something went wrong with those temperature probes, or someone was playing around with them, or something went wrong, but there was evidently some unusual behavior at that point in time. Okay? For that very short period of time, and then it all went back into control. So if we looked at our latent vector, relative to our latent variable, those points stick out very strongly. They're actually as sharp as outliers. But the majority of the data forms a line along which uh, those, those, they're with error. But there's generally a line that can be drawn through these data, through that data cloud. We'll call this, these things a data cloud. And then there's some measure of error away from that line. Okay, I'm just introducing the basic concept here. We'll go much more into detail next class. How many later variables would we have in this case? We'll talk about that in the next class as well. How do we determine that? Yeah. So, what we do then with PCA, all that PCA says, this is in English, but we'll look at it in mathematical terms next class. PCA says, find me the best summary of my data, x, we'll call this x, with the fewest number of summary variables or latent variables, and we'll call each latent variable a score, T, capital T. So we'll compress our many columns here in X, capital K, to a very small number of latent variables, capital A latent variables, so one, two, three, up to capital A. So we've reduced our data from a high dimensional space, K dimensions, down to just a few dimensions, we'll call those scores T's. So the first column we'll call T1, T2, T3, up to T capital. We'll go through the notation next time. So just want the concepts to be uh, something that uh, you start to become familiar with. And so the algorithm for PCA simply says plot the data and fit that first component through the direction of greatest variance. Okay, so it just finds that direction through which the majority of the data lies, and that's the first component. The second component will be orthogonal to that, and we can add a third component. But the main principle is that we start to reduce our higher dimensional space down to a smaller dimensional space. Okay. So for that temperature example, if I plot the first latent vector, T1, up here, that's what it looks like. So a quick, a quick explanation of this plot is as follows. I've gone from four columns in capital X 
So this is temperature 1, temperature 2, temperature 3, and temperature 4. Okay. So I've got sample 1, 2, 3, and let's say, I, okay, I have 140, 145 samples there over this three-day period. And I've reduced that down to now a single column called T1. So every set of four measurements, four temperature measurements in the front, left, front, uh, right, back, left, back, right, has been compressed down to a single number over here, T1, at that point in time. Then I take my next row and I compress those four numbers down to another single number T1 at the second instant in time. Okay. That's what T1. So I didn't have, I ran out of time to generate this plot nicely, but basically these plots should match up. So you can see in T1, the trend in T1 is the same trend that you see in the raw data with slightly less error. Okay, so this raw data has got a lot of noise over here, we've got slightly less noise. And if the best explanation of these four data points using just one new column. So I've compressed my four columns down to one column. We'll talk about the mathematics in the next one. I just want you to get comfortable with the concept that PCA is just doing a reduction. And if you had to do this in practice, Okay, if I asked you what is the best estimate of the temperature in this room and I want one number from you, what will you do? The average of the first four. Okay. And that's exactly what the first component is. We'll prove this mathematically without telling PCA what to do. It will come out with exactly that. Something very similar to saying 0.25 times the first temperature plus 0.25 the next, 0.25 the third, and 0.25. It takes a quarter of each temperature, forms a weighted sum, and calculates T1. So if mathematically I want to write this in matrix form, I can just do the following and recall this vector x, this is our data of the temperatures. These values here, the coefficients 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, those are the loadings. We'll call those P. So we can say T is equal to x times P. You'll see that uh, if you read the paper by John McGregor, you would have seen that equation. But conceptually, we're doing nothing more than forming a linear combination. That's all that this means. For those of you who think back to your second year and first year algebra, that's just a linear combination of your x's and the coefficients in the linear combination of those moments. So much more next class. I promise you, if you feel lost already, don't worry. I just want the general concept to be there. So that's T1. We can also form T2. T2 looks something as follows, mainly zeros, and then T2 explains that temporary blip in the data and then continues on to mainly zero. We'll calculate this in class next time. So these two variables, T1 and T2, summarize then. We've reduced from four variables down to two variables. Okay. So remember how previously I had to plot x1, x2 versus x3 on that rotating cube to visualize my data. Well, what if now, instead of plotting x1, x2, x3, and I actually don't have x4, I have no knowledge of x4. What if, instead of that, I plot t1 versus t2? Okay. These, I've, I've said now these two variables summarize these four variables, so this would actually be a better plot to look at if I want to understand what my data is doing. And this sort of plot, I don't have it here in the slides, but this is called the score plot. Okay, because each of this is a score, and that's a score. Each one of these, each T is called a score. So more on this terminology next week. And PLS, which is the other latent variable method we'll deal with, now we throw in an extra complication. We've got an X and we've got a Y. We'll calculate our t's from both of those simultaneously. Okay, but let's leave that detail to the side. Okay, so now what I wanted to do in the last uh, few minutes is about half an hour. Um, I just wanted to show a few examples of what we can do with these latent variable methods. And I need to introduce this terminology to you 
so that these case studies can mean something. So one of the first case studies that were looked at here by John McGregor and, and his student Carol Swammer. She was a master's student and back in 91, or actually earlier, this was in the late 80s, she wrote her thesis in 91. She got this huge data dump from Shell in Montreal. 300 measurements, three and a half months of data on this flow sheet. Messy flow sheet. There's a, a regenerator, a reactor, a, a main column, and then several columns to clean up the separation. Lots of variables. Okay? 300 of them on this particular case. How the hell would you start to look at that database? Three and a half months of data. Back then in 91, her computer couldn't even load those data sets up. Like this was, for those of you that don't remember, there were even things like math coprocessors that one bought to boost your mathematical capability of your computer. But that doesn't mean anything to any of you, you're all too young. But um, this was the reality. Like she couldn't deal with this large amount of data on her computer. How do you even start to visualize? Do you go and plot 300 time series plots over three and a half months and scroll through every single time series plot to see what each variable is doing. My God, no, like after two days of that, even though you're an unpaid graduate student, you're going to give up and quit. So you have to have smarter ways to deal with this big data set. And here we summarize in T1 and T2, the score plot, all the interesting periods from that whole three and a half months. Every single plot represents a point in time and is a summary of those 300 columns. Okay, so now K is equal to 300 columns this time, and we're still going down to two columns. We're reducing 300 data, uh, 300 columns in one row. This is one point in time, the next point in time, etc., right up till 3.5 months. So we've still got the same number of rows, but now we're reducing 300 columns down to two. We can see here, well, for most of the time, the, react, the whole flow sheet operated in region A. Then there was something that happened to cause it to move to B. Then it moved to this other cluster here. And then it transitioned to another cluster and then over to C. So immediately Carol knows, I don't need to spend all my time looking at this chunk of data. I can just look at a few representative points here and see what happened. And then I can move my attention to those points at that time to see what happened, and I can look at which variables caused that shift. But there's no way I'm going to deal with this data set. I'd much rather deal with this data set, T1, T2, and figure out what's going on. Okay? So this is learning from data. What has happened? When has it happened? And where do I spend my energy to understand my process? Learn more. I do this all the time, right? I'm, I'm new at my company. I just started there in July. They've got these data sets that are going back years and years. No one is there to say, Kevin, this is how the process works, and, and spend lots of time with me. I just have to take that data set and try to uncover which variables are related to what, how does the process behave, and this is the tool I use to try and learn more about my process. Okay. Another case study. This was a case study I worked on with the plastics company in north of Toronto. They produced this product and they measured A, B, C, D, E, and F as their variables. So six variables, six columns. I can't disclose what the variables are. There are variables that you can measure in any laboratory, okay? So for those of you that deal with polymers, you would know what those types of variables would be. But this, every, uh, it came out as purple on my screen with that blue ish here. Every single blue point represents a sample from their product. So they produce the product, after a few hours they take a sample, measure those six variables, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, next few hours later, so every data point represents a sample from their process. This company also goes and buys their competitors' products. From time to time, they go to somewhere and they get their competitors' product, and they measure those same six values on their competitors' product. What they've done here was quite interesting. So we've got six columns now. So K is equal to six. A, num a certain number of rows is, let's call it company X. Um, that's bad terminology. Let's call it company C. 
and then well, that's also bad. Let's call it A, and then they're compared to C. So they've got those same six columns from the competitor. Okay, just tacked onto the bottom of the data set. So now when we're plotting T1 and T2, all I've done is I've color coded the competitor's products in green with red squares and their products in purple. This showed them immediately why their competitor had greater market share. Their competitor is able to produce the product with so much less variability. They always operate in the very same type cluster. Their product, on the other hand, they were selling to their customers is all over the map. Sometimes their customers would receive products from this cluster, then over there. When, they, when their um, clients or customers receive that product, they're producing some form of plastic from it. And maybe when it's from here, the plastic product they produce is too brittle and breaks. So they get, they get frustrated because this company is selling them product that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. When they buy the product from their competitor, it always works because their competitor is able to produce such a well-controlled product. Also, they can ask the question, what the hell conditions are these so that I can emulate my, my competitor? It's very easy. If you look inside this cluster, there are some blue points in here. So they can easily go back to their database and say, when we produce that product at that point in time, these were the characteristics on our process. Let's make sure we always operate like this. Okay. So learning from data. What is your competitor doing? What am I doing? And, and what are the differences? Okay. Let's move on to one of the other objectives, troubleshooting. <laughs> this was a classic example. Uh, any of you that have taken John McGregor's course or, or heard John speak, you'll use this case study. This company uh, was a, a member here of the university's MACC consortium. They had a problem on their process. So they deal with the monomer, 447 columns. So K is now 447. And what happened is they were producing this product, 500 days of operation. And then suddenly they had this issue where at around day 400, their recovery and their recovery is me measured right here at the end. So normally you put A into the process, chemical A, at 20% purity. At the end you recover 99.5% and you can calculate your recovery from that. So normally they get pretty good recovery. You see some numbers, sometimes you're above 100% recovery because it's a calculated value. So the mass balance doesn't always work out. But what they noticed was around day 400, Recovery dropped off. Okay, so in this case, you have sample one, two, three, up to 400. Then suddenly, 401 to 500. This period of data represents problematic operation. This period of data represents reasonable operation. Okay. We want to find out which of these 447 variables changed over this period of time. How would you do that? If you had to do this today in a process, your boss hands you this data set, 500 rows, 440 columns, and asks you, what happened around day 400? What would you do? Yeah. Matt? Uh, look at around day 400, and see uh, if there is any variation of different, uh, well, I guess it might not be feasible, but look at the 447 different tags, maybe plot the variance between that day and then the day, uh, the day before it. Okay, so actually to be honest, it didn't happen exactly at 400, it happened around day 400. So I still okay. see what you're saying though, you take a group before, and then compare it, because it's pretty, uh, pretty short constant short. right before that time it drops, right. right? You can get an idea of what the other variables should be, right? Not and you do that 440 times, 447 times. No, but... <laughs> but no, theoretically, let's thinking. say this, this problem is costing you a million dollars a day, which is not uncommon in these industries. 
let's say it's a pretty valuable chemical, so this problem needs to be solved. You've gone for 100 days, and you've lost $100 million, and now upper management is barking down the throat. And you're working overtime 12 hours till you find this problem. You would do that. You would find that problem tediously and manually. By what, uh, that's what I would do, right? If I didn't know any better, I would do exactly what you said. I'd take the data before, maybe calculate an average, the data after, calculate an average, and then just plot those and see what changed out of the 447 variables. Is that something that sounds reasonable? Right? So a common approach. Um, so this is, the company actually did this. They spent hours doing this, but they still couldn't find it. Okay? Still couldn't find the major variables responsible for that change. So they phoned John McGregor up and asked him, can you help? And John just gave the student to, uh, gave the problem to the students who were there. And she, or he, I forget, looked at it over the weekend. On, got the data set on Friday, looked at it over the weekend, did this. Score plot, T1, T2. Okay. So this is T1 on the horizontal axis, T2 on the vertical axis, and all these points from day 0 to four, uh, 400 are roughly in this cluster with circles, and then the stars, uh, the, the pluses are the days 401 onwards. Okay. Very clear distinction on a shift that's changed in the process. And then we ask our latent variable model, what is the difference between a point from this cluster and a point from this cluster? What are the major variables that change from one group to the other group? Okay. And it's called a contribution plot. So in the next class, we'll start to look at these contribution plots. It clearly shows that out of these 447 variables, the largest bars represent the variables that you can focus on. They're not necessarily the cause for the problem, but it's eliminated you, you from spending time looking at 447 variables down to four or five variables here. So it's, a, it's just a, it's a, a screening tool, as it were, to eliminate the worst or the unnecessary variables. So column uh, 207 in the data set corresponded to the temperature on tray 129 in distillation column 3. So back in the flow sheet over there, you can go look at column 3 over here. Tray 129 in that column, that was the temperature probe on that. Column 158 showed up as a large contribution. It was a tag from distillation column three as well. And tags 33 and 277 were related to the feed of uh, the concentration of the feed A, right in the start of the flow sheet. Yes? Can you actually get more than two components? I mean, we Oh, for sure. Uh, for sure, yeah. And for now, for illustration purposes, we generally look at T1, T2, but you will, we'll always look at more components if they are. Yeah. And what does T1 and T2 represent? There are these latent variables that summarize all these 447 columns down to two columns. So we create these new variables, T1 and T2, these latent variables. We'll talk about how we do that next time. But these two variables summarize all 447 original columns in the, in the best way possible. They, uh, the, the best summary you can make of these 447 Remember, I'm saying the word best that indicates that there's some sort of optimization going on underneath that. We'll look at that in detail next time. Yeah? But, but if you have four components, would you actually have it on the same graph in order to get the relationship between them? And there? So you look at T1, T2, T1, T3, T2, T3. You'll still use the normal tools that you use, but now you've only got four variables to look at instead of 447. Okay? What if, like, instead of using T1 and T2, what if we just fit a regression line and then just try to analyze? Because we have the data which we can get, we can get our algorithm trained on. So we oh, so train an algorithm on that, and then we can just predict the value. Okay, what should be the the uh, yeah, real value? Yeah, you could do a multiple linear regression between 447 x variables and one y variable. Yes. Okay. That multiple linear regression, x transpose x inverse, x transpose y, which is how the coefficients are calculated in the linear regression, will not, will not work. Because x transpose x is, is uh, highly collinear. Okay. 
and we'll go into that when we get to PLS. So for now, if you can believe me, that I can guarantee you that that least squared regression will, if it doesn't, if it doesn't crash your computer, it will at least give you uh, uh, confidence intervals and regression coefficients that are so wide that they all span zero. So you don't have time Somebody has proposed that uh, this, this algorithm is better than the regular Well, yeah, so you'll see multiple linear regression. We'll cover that in, in a lot of detail when we look at PLS, but it, that approach won't really work. And if anything, it will just tell you how to predict Y from X, but it won't tell you what causes the problem and what's related to the problem. But that's a, that's a good pull, just hold it for later on for a few classes for now. Yeah. To calculate the value for two one and two, we need to select which variables from the data, the raw data, need to use in order to. No, we use that. all four hundred and forty-seven columns for T one, T two, for both T one, T two. So again, we'll look at that detail next class. I have, today's class is more conceptual and what we can do with the tools. Next class we'll go into the detail. This happens, it's, it's normal, please ask away. But every time I teach the class and the overview, everyone's like, but how do you know how many components? How do you calculate T1, T2? How do you know what the loadings are? Everyone wants to know the details and that's great. And I really want you to do that. Next class though, we'll look at how you do it. Today I just want to see what you can do with the tools. Okay. So. Uh, the student that, that looked at this, she came up with these four variables. She spoke to John McGregor on Monday and said, I think the problem is related to the temperature on tray 129 in this relation, column 3, when we're putting high levels of concentration of feed into the system. Okay, so she looked at the data and that was her conclusion. When John phoned on Monday to the company, the company said our engineers were looking through historical archives of the company. Um, when the engineers make changes to the process, they have to document it. And they found over the weekend independently that someone had gone and turned off the temperature controller on tray 129 in distillation column 3. So they weren't controlling that temperature anymore. Previously they were. So both of them came to the same conclusion. Company X, though, spent 100 days spending however many million of dollars finding that problem. Okay? Whereas it could have been done a lot sooner and with less engineering efforts had to use some tool like this too. When we deal with big data sets like this, that's when later variable methods work really well. What year we are talking about here? 1990s. Okay, so I'll skip this example and let's move to um, predictions. So another application of uh, PLS is to build models that do predictions. So this is kind of what you were hinting at. But we'll look at the latent variable approach. The latent variable approach says, I've got data X and I've got data Y and I want to predict Y from X. So a classic example is on a distillation column, I want to predict the purity of my the liquid coming out of my distillation column from my X data. Now, measuring the purity, you take a sample from your process, send it to the lab, have someone analyze it, and about eight hours later, you get an answer of what the purity Y is. It takes a long time. In the meantime, you could have produced bad product for those eight hours that you need to go scrap or store or blend away in some form. So, wouldn't it be great if you can take those data that you collected from the lab, Y, and line it up with the conditions on your process X, which you can measure in real time. Usually, in chemical processes, we're getting this X data, and we're getting a new row every few minutes, and we're getting it automatically. And if the moment this row becomes available, I can put it into a model that will predict Y right away. Then I don't have to wait eight hours for the lab value. And I can actually make do feedback control on that. I can adjust my process to counteract bad operation. So that's exactly the principle. Offline, we'll take a, a body of historical data, n rows from x, n rows from y, build a model. In the future, we get a new x row, and we're going to predict y. We maybe get the actual value of y from the lab eight hours later. We can compare our prediction and see that it's reasonable. Okay? But in real time, in the meantime, we can use this line predictor to 
do things like feedback control or something like that. Okay, so uh, one of the actually one of the first projects I worked on after leaving the university course was this project here with Petro Canada, using the temperature probes on the distillation column and the pressures here. I was able to predict the purity of the distillate leaving at the top. And just a quick uh, plot of the data here. It's not very clear, but in green here is the Antoine prediction. The Antoine prediction is a very simple equation that the engineers use that says vapor pressure, which is the purity, is A plus B times T plus C times P, where A, B, and C are calculated from linear regression. Um, and actually, sometimes it's, it's 1 divided by T. And usually, P is log P. So they use these three coefficients that they've empirically determined to take the temperature at this location here, usually on that top tray. They take the pressure there from the condenser. They put that into the equation, and they predict vapor pressure. That's called the Antoine equation. So in green is the Antoine equation predictions. In red is the lab values, and in blue is the PLS. So the PLS values are, are a little closer than the Antoine equation. And in fact, um, when the plant was shut down and brought back online, they usually had to refit the Antoine equation. With the PLS, we were able to keep going with the predictions. So we'll talk about this much more. This is the classic uh, case study of the soft sensor uh, or software sensor, being able to predict a Y in software that's otherwise hard to measure. Do you have a question? No? Okay. Um, if you want to read another interesting application, uh, this uh, journal article here, there's the DOI number. Or if you've got the electronic notes, you can click on that. There's a hyperlink to the, to the article. They use PLS to take as inputs um, the personality data. So if you apply for a new job, very often they have you write a personality test. It tells you your profile. You're introverted, extroverted, you do this, you do that, etc. Et so what they did is they used those data from that personality test to predict um, various diagnostics of how the employee will, will work. And I've seen this used in another company, um, not in a journal article way. They actually use it to track uh, for sales reps. They, they can predict how well the sales rep will produce for the company and whether to hire them or not. So hiring decisions are often made on based on these models. So this person is unsuitable or suitable. Or if the person is somewhat suitable, it shows which areas they need some training in in order to make them even more suitable. Okay, so it can predict shortcomings for that particular job function. Um, I don't like those sort of models myself. From a moral point of view, I have some hang-ups about that, but that's a different issue. Uh, here's another very interesting example, an electronic nodes to determine whether leaf, that vacuum pack leaf is going to spoil or not. So, uh, this is an interesting article. They take data from 10 metal oxide semiconductors, CO2 sensor, and these Tegushi sensors, and those values, these 15 values, are used as inputs to predict Y, the spoilage. Now, their original Y to build the model, so you always need data to build your model, back up here, their original measurement of spoilage was determined by a very expensive trained sensory panel. You pay a lot of people to smell and taste various pieces of beef, and then they give a level of spoilage value, say from 0 to 7. You can go and use that data and predict what the sensory panel would have predicted using a latent variable model. So if you, every, you can now apply this model much faster. You don't have to pay a whole bunch of people to come to your location and smell meat. You, you can get the same predict, or roughly the same level of prediction. You can always use that panel occasionally to validate that your model is still working, and you should do that. Another prediction example, um, Hong Lu, you was a, a, a PhD student here with John. I worked with her for a number of years, and particularly on this project. With this company, they were predicting the level of seasoning of snack food. Very similar idea to electronic modes. You have a, a hard to do laboratory test to measure the seasoning, but in real time, they would like to be able to predict what the seasoning is. 
obviously because if they're producing a uh, the snack food, moving along the process and the seasoning is off spec, and they discover that in the lab test eight hours later, they have to go and re maybe scrap eight hours worth of production, which is expensive. So if you can put a digital camera on the process, take a color image, just another form of data like we showed earlier, take that data from the camera, feed it to a computer, and then adjust some of the lines that are coming out here on this slide, adjust the level of seasoning applied to the tumbler so that coming out here is always a consistent product. Um, and then, so this journal paper describes the, the procedure for PCA that was used. And you can see here in the plant tests. So the gray lines represent the data where the seasoning was measured, and then these are the lab values. So the gray lines are the predictions from the camera. We get much faster predictions. And then these dots represent the errors, uh, the, the lab values and the standard errors from the lab for those predictions. So the model was able to reproduce the lab value, but in real time. And then they put it in feedback control so that now no product is, is, is produced. This is now used uh, throughout the world by this company and all their production facilities. <clears throat> okay, um, we're doing it for time here. Okay, so I'll, I'll just give a, a few more examples here and then we'll wrap up. Process monitoring was, was the fourth major application of late materials. And here in Hamilton, we have uh, ArcelorMittal, formerly known as Tabasco. The They've used these tools for a number of years, and they have many, many applications of it going. So here's one example of it. So they, they have this big container of molten steel. So over here is the, the lid, and underneath it is the, the molten metal. And this container here is, is put over, um, I forget the terminology here, this is the ladle, I don't know what that's called, but then this metal is extruded out into, into slabs. So here's one slab coming off, and as it's extruded, the outer shell of the metal cools down, the inner shell, or the inner part is still molten, liquid metal. And if you slow down the rate at which you extrude, you form a more complete shell. If you speed up the rate at which you extrude, you run the risk that not everything is quite cooled down, and that part of the shell that hasn't cooled down can erupt or break out, as, the, as it's called, and then you have this molten metal splashed around on the conveyor, and it's a safety issue as well, and, as well as lost production in time. Okay, so what Defasco does is they record data from their process, real-time temperatures, and several other parameters, and they do, in fact, some extra engineering calculations to create that X matrix um, and use that data to monitor the process. Am I operating okay, or am I operating in a region that has a risk of high breakouts? The moment they see this risk of high breakouts, an alarm is sent to the operator so that they can slow down the process. Okay. So they use this real-time data to adjust for how fast they're extruding. So those two variables that they plot here are nothing more than T squared and SPE. We'll talk about that in the next class. And they get contribution plots to show them what part of the process has changed the most. And what this has done, then, uh, there's a vertical line around the year 1997. This was the number of breakouts they had per year prior to installing the system from 97 onwards. They now average two to three breakouts per year. And that's easily saved about a million dollars of, of um, just economic from not having a breakout. There's also the, the shutdown and equipment changeover that needs to take place. So tremendous savings from using this data in real time. Uh, Debating if I should do the batch process. Yeah, okay, so we've spoken about batch. Uh, I'll just quickly do the batch process in one other example and then we'll wrap up. So we, we looked at the batch data earlier on. We'll talk in, the, in about the fifth or, uh, sorry, the seventh or eighth week of the course how we deal with batch data. 
but we can also monitor that process. And so what will happen is, um, and I, I'm actually working on a system in my company right now that does is this sort of thing. Okay, so if we're, if we're monitoring for a good batch, as the batch is progressing in time, so remember the batch is, uh, in this example, is about 300 minutes, we can construct a plot that shows, is my batch operating in control or out of control? And over time, as long as it stays within these limits of T1 and T2, so these are high and low limits, and those limits are found from previous batches, we can say we're operating stably. Similarly, we have a T squared that needs to be below the green line and get an SP below the green line. The moment it goes outside those limits, we can do contribution plots and figure out what went wrong with the process. But you have no idea how much money this can save the company because if the process operates inside those limits, they don't need to wait at the end of the batch and test it. They can send it to the next step in the flow sheet right away. The normal approach is to leave the material in the batch. So there's our batch sitting there. And they take a sample, send it to the lab, and then wait 8 to 12 hours to get a result. In the meantime, that process cannot do anything else. It has to just sit there. So there's a huge holdup. So from a scheduling point of view, that's a bad decision. If you could send it on to the next step in the flow sheet without having to wait a couple of hours, you could increase the throughput on that production process by, by a significant amount. So what these companies do now is, provided it's within the limits for the whole duration, they release it to the next stage and they can free up the reactor for the next batch. Uh, so that's a good batch and then a bad batch would look anything that goes out of control. So for example, Here's a batch that right off the bat, it, it snuck over that green limit, which is our warning limit, and then over there, trigger that point. You could stop the batch early, or you could do a contribution plot and see what went wrong and see if you can perhaps save the batch. This batch carried on, went well outside the 99% limit over here, and on SP up there. So this batch was bad from all the all the three monitoring plots and had either has to be scrapped or, or reworked in some way. And I know we're tired, so one last example of the final way we can use data. Right at the end of the course, we'll look at this concept of model inversion and process optimization. This actually is one area which is extremely powerful. Companies are making a lot of money by using their historical data and learning how to improve their processes from it. The principle here is simple. Normally, we go and build a model from X and Y. So we've got a model, let's say a latent variable model, PLS or PCA. Your customer comes to you and says, I like your product, I like what you're doing, I'm producing something that requires something similar to what you produce, but a little bit different. And they tell you what their specifications are. So something kind of like what they've had from you, but they want something a little bit different. So they're telling you, I would like certain properties, why? Normally you're selling them a product with a given property. Now they want something new, why desired. And you want to run this backwards and say, how do I need to set the settings in my process X. So what temperature, what flow rate, what pressure, what pH, what conditions should I use over here in X in order to get that prediction? So we're inverting the model. Okay. This is extremely powerful and can be done for many processes. I've worked on the company's data set that they wanted food product with certain specifications, so certain texture and so on for food, and we found which recipe to use, how, which settings, the time duration and con ingredient levels, uh, which fraction of ingredients they should use to achieve that target. So normally when companies do this, their customer comes to says, I want this, they go off and do experiments. And they do experiments forever. Ten, tens of, sometimes that's a small number, but usually it often runs into the hundreds of experiments. 
when they tweak all the settings one at a time, which is very bad for those of you that know anything about DOE, you should never do it one at a time, but they often go do one at a time experimentation to try and find this. And sometimes they hit the jackpot and get it, other times they go to the customer, sorry, we can't make it. Latent variable methods will be able to tell right off the bat whether we can make it or not. That's easy to say. And then secondly, we'll, we'll see how, how to make it. Okay, so we'll save that for the end of the course. Coming back again to your competitor's example. I'm operating over here. How do I adjust my process to achieve what my competitor is doing? Okay, we can the same same concept. Okay, so let me jump right to the end. But before I get there, I'm going to leave this section for you to do on your own. And this is a section that's normally taught in undergraduate courses, so it's not really part of this course, but it is important. All the pages on data visualization. So this page, data visualization onwards, read it at your own time. Uh, it talks about box plots. It talks about time series plots. It talks about bar plots and histograms and scatter plots. None of this is new. You've all used these tools before. And we will use these tools throughout this course. So you need to know what a scatter plot is, what a bar plot is, and a time series plot. We'll use that all the time. So please read through those notes on your own. And then for next class, this is this is what you need to do for next class. We'll talk about this. I want you to think over the next few days of any concept which is unmeasurable but is clearly a late, clearly a latent variable. So we mentioned that concept of health or quality of life, right? Again, in groups next or groups of two next time, I'm going to have each each group come up and talk about some latent variable that they thought of and describe that to the class and also describe which measurements you would take to try and calculate that latent variable. So like the health measurement measures my blood sugar level, my blood pressure, etc. Those are measurements that can be used as inputs to try and predict my health. So do the same for your example. I want you to read uh, paper 13 on that literature website. Uh, it's by Swansea Wald, who's, who developed the method of PLS. Okay? But he wrote a very good tutorial paper on PCA. So next class is only PCA. We'll be looking at the theory in depth, the geometric interpretation, algebraic interpretation, and mathematical interpretation. So you need to brush up on linear algebra. That's expected by now. Uh, at this level of graduate studies, I expect you all to be excellent in linear algebra. We'll be looking at linear algebra, interpretation, geometrical interpretation. And if you need a refresher on any of those, definitely read this paper. We'll have an informal Q&A in the class on it um, next time. And also install the software for the course. Um, I'll, I'll post a link on the website for it. And I'll ask you to bring your laptop because at the, the last half an hour or hour of the class, we'll actually work through the software on a case study. So uh, if there's a group of you, you can bring one laptop for the two of you or three of you. Um, you there's power outlets infrequently around the class, but we're only going to use it for half an hour or so, so your, your battery should be last for that period. So those are the pieces of work for next time. And, um, Class next Friday at 2 o'clock. Okay.